Alistair Clarkson. Let's get real close. Let's get a little bit closer so you can see me real close here. Will Phillips kept Nick Dacos to 19 touches, six score involvements, zero goal assists in three quarters of footy. Let's get a bit closer. What do you decide to do? Tactically sub him out. In the fourth quarter, Dacos had 10 disposals, four score involvements, three goal assists, and went from zero votes to three Brownlow votes because you decided to tactically sub out Will Phillips. Well done, Australia losers. My number five best player of round 14 was Joe Danaher. Every now and again, he just has these games where he kicks a load of goals, gets up the ground, is great as a second ruckman. This game kicked five goals, got 20 touches, played as a winger for, for about 20 to 30% of the game, played as the second ruck, really got up the ground, took 12 marks, and was a huge game changer. My number five player of the round was Joe Danaher, and my number four player of the round, Isaac Heaney, who uh, I don't know how many times he's featured, but having an, having an all-time season and... Another, just a quiet game, two goals, 29, I think three goal assists, and just did just did absolutely everything, right? I didn't have Isaac Heaney in my top five. I decided to steer clear just to give some other guys a chance. Brody Grundy was my number four. He's charging towards the All-Australian Ruck. Max Gorn has had a quiet few weeks, and Grundy is just putting the foot down. It really seems like he's coming to his own in, the, in this Swans midfield. He had 31 disposals at, as a Ruckman, eight score involvements, nine clearances, and 24 contested possessions. I have He was my number three player of the round, so we'll get straight into that. Just to add to those stats, 49 hitouts, and gosh, the amount of hitouts to advantage, his ruck craft is phenomenal. Just to add to everything else there, his clearance work, his hands, he absolutely, I think Max Gorn and him have both had undeniably all Australian, se uh, all Australian seasons. I think they have to put them both in there. One of them on the bench. One, them, I don't care which is which, just squeeze them both in 100%. there. Who's your number three? My number three was James Sicily. Now, love it. Absolutely game love it. after game, it feels like time slows down when he has the ball. And then he just pulls up the low bullet kick about 50 to 60 meters. He can hit someone on the chest. 70 to 80. And it's when he's taking those intercept. He had 10 intercept possessions in this game, 33 disposals. But he can have a 20 disposal game and be yep. just as damaging. Yep. Just when he gets going and he can take control of the defense and he can set up the attack. It's just a real joy to watch. And he's one of my favorite players in the competition. Yep. I think my opinion was that he was maybe the second best defender in the league last year behind Sam Taylor. Had a slow start to this year, but as the Hawks have started just absolutely charging, so has James Sicily. He's been phenomenal. My number two was the Bont. Uh, he just tore apart the game. Three goals and 30. Uh, when he was in the midfield, he was dominating the game and getting the ball forward for the Bulldogs. And then when he rested forward, he kicks three goals, took on two potential All-Australian uh, defenders this year, and Luke Ryan and Alex Pierce, along with a third defender, just to snap a goal from nowhere. He just is absolutely electric. Uh, reminded us all that he might be the best player in the comp. And I, what else can you say? I also had Marcus Bontempelli at number two. In any other round in this year, and I mean it when I say that, this guy is number one. Yep. He's the number one best player in the round. I won't go on too much, but my number one was, was Joel Amati. Who else could it be? All I'm going to say is he has nine goals one, ten disposals total in the game. Sorry, babe. Can't talk right now. Joel Amati has nine at Adelaide Oval. We're going to move on to a new segment. We're talking about the top ten players aged 21 and under. My tenth best player under 21 is Will Ashcroft. Haven't seen a lot of him this year, but he really burst onto the scene last year and was a huge reason why Brisbane made it to the grand final. My number nine is George Wardlaw. Had a massive game today as well, having a really good season. Potential rising star with a few outs. One of the best on the ground. Too. 100%. Number eight, another sort of breakout season this year is Jake Saligo. Number seven is Harley Reid. I found it hard to put him too high. Wow. Because he hasn't played as many games as the others. Yep. My number six is Josh Weddle absolutely love this guy he's, he's just the reincarnation of Nick Blakey even though they're pretty much the same age my number five is Finn Callahan. he's just racking up the touches this year good looking bloke my number four is Jason Horn Francis uh, we've seen what he's done since he's come from North Melbourne he's doing it in the Port Adelaide midfield he can play forward he can play in the middle he, he just bursts from stoppage absolutely love it my number three is Nasai Wanganin Malira my number two is Harry Sheasel. It's about time he started moving up the ground, and he's still he's a lot more damaging now. Still racking up the touches, but much more impact. Love it in the forward half. My number one, who else could it be? It's Nick Dacos. He's one of the best players in the competition, top three player since he pretty much came into the competition. So there was pretty much no argument. I'm just going to jump in and tell you the ones that I, that you've clearly forgotten. 
Uh, I had Mac Andrew at number six, oh, who has wow. been one of the yeah. premier key backs in the comp. He's, he's shown like a leaping power and an ability to crash packs that not a lot of young key defenders can. And you've forgotten Sam Darcy, who I have at number four. I think I, it's so difficult to be a, a, like a strong player in the league as a key for, as a young key forward. Uh, and I think Sam Darcy is is breaking onto the scene like we haven't seen a key forward do for a little while. I'm just going to put my hands up and say <laughs> I would have definitely had him in my top 10 because I wrote about 25 names down when I was making yeah. this top 10. Did not have either of them. So I completely missed them. That's my bad. 100%. We must have used different 10. websites to find the young guys. 100%. The only other comment I'll make is that I had Harley Reid at number two. I think he's already that good. Uh, I think he can have a 15 disposal, one goal game. But just every every time he touches the ball, he's fending two blokes off. Offending, he'll, he'll fend yeah. off your captain. <laughs> 100%. He'll go to the vice captain next. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But Clayton Oliver and Christian Petrarca in one 100%. play. 100%. Yeah. But I just want to say another, another interesting stat is just the importance of the first round draft picks. So of my top 10, seven were drafted in the top five. Wow. Nine were drafted in the top 20. And only Saligo of mine was drafted at 36. Really interesting. And I think that that's changing in the league. I know that we didn't plan to talk about this, but I think a lot, a lot of the time in the past, some of the absolute superstars of our league have come later in the draft. But now that there's a really good like junior program, development scouting program, I think the good guys really come through to the top of the draft by the time they get there. 100%, 100%. Just shows the, the need to get these first round draft picks if you, want to, if you want to start some sort of a rebuild. We'll move on to our next segment in hits and misses. Doss has already ranted about Alistair Clarkson, so that'll be his miss. My miss for the round... The Wizard, we absolutely love him. I think he's going to be a star, and I, I think we all want him to be a star. He needs to kick straighter. It's it's something, I saw a commentator say, it's, it, Buddy Franklin had similar blues early in his career where he, know, he knew he was talented, he knew he could do things differently, and so he was kicking strangely, really inaccurate. But he found that he just had to keep it a bit more simple, and that's what Nick Watson's got to do. Um, I'm not a goal-kicking coach, but you can't run sideways and then just kick it 90 degrees across your body. Unless you're Brian you Myers. Ryan Myers is good at it. He's one of the best kicks in the game. But if you're not Ryan Myers, don't do it. And it's clearly not working. So you got you got to change something up. I like that. My my hit is the Swans just have that aura around them. A thirty point deficit feels like a six point deficit. <laughs> there are weapons all over the field. If he doesn't get you, Warner will. Golden will. Grundy will. The last few games, Taylor Adams will. Papley will. Pap- Papley will. Blakey will. Amadi will. All they need is one or two of them to get you. And it's game over. So if we don't see Swans on grand final day, something's seriously gone wrong. Completely agree. Love that hit. Uh, no biased reason. Just just really like the take. Uh, <laughs> not because I'm a Swans fan. So for my hit, I just want to take a moment to appreciate the career so far of Dustin Martin. He's the best player I've ever seen, and I'm very confident saying that. Uh, and I think I know that there's a, you know there's jokes about you know really just riding these guys like Nick Dacos and Dustin Martin, but he truly does embody everything that I love about football. Uh, he's got like the flair and the power that no one else really has, but he's also always just been this incredibly humble guy with a team first mindset, a one club man. Um, and this week, seeing the second biggest crowd outside of Anzac Day games crazy, since however when ninety something thousand uh, at the MCG, seeing him drive through drive it through from 50 for the first goal of the match uh, and seeing Richmond fans and Hawthorne fans alike in the crowd cheering that goal and, st- and standing up I haven't seen it since Buddy's thousandth and there are those sort of special players that can get that get crowd like the opposition fans to cheer for them and so um, I think we're all appreciative of what Dusty's done for the game you couldn't write that any better could yeah. you yeah. running in from 50 for the first goal yeah. of his 300th and he absolutely nails it it's and just on that I think they absolutely nailed it with the Dustin Martin barbershop that they had outside <laughs> I think they said there were 84 that went through and got the free Dustin yeah. Martin cut awesome so I absolutely love that from the AFL we'll move on to the next segment in the footy pyramid we have two outs in the pyramid this week Luke Ryan and Zach Butters, who's been absolutely hammered by the tag of, of Toby Bedford, which means we have two new ins. Libertore is now Ooh, in the top 15 players. He, he's awesome. He, he was injured for a few weeks. Is probably why he wasn't in here earlier. And James Sicily is making making an appearance in the in the top 15 after I think starting in the top 15 in the, in round one. I think he absolutely deserves to be in there. 100. percent And now this this period was quite tough because a lot of people had buys. So uh, most of it is kept the same, but I'll just roll through it. In the fifth tier, joining them is, is Sam Walsh, Lockie Neal, and Will Day. In the fourth tier, staying all the same, 
Crips, Gorn, Kono, and Merritt. We have one change in the third tier. Nick Dacos stays in the third tier. Chad Warner drops down to the third tier. And Sarong holds his spot in the third tier. In the second tier is Errol Goulden. And joining him now is Marcus Bontempelli. There was really no discussion here. But Isaac Heaney has another awesome game. And it's going to be really hard to catch him at number one. And now let's jump into the power rankings. North sit in 18th still, and they are inching their way up. I did not think they'd get out of 18th this year, but they've got a win against West Coast, followed by what really should have been. Are we going to talk about the, that a 50 point? We 52, haven't talked about it yet. 50, 54, 54. 54 point lead. And they were up 49 to 8. And then they extended the lead from that. Oh my gosh. And you could feel them coming. They had Toby Pink scoring goals. It was they, all happening. They were, they were loving it. They, they kicked. Eight goals in the first quarter, then six goals, then four goals, and then couldn't hit the scoreboard in the fourth. You had Aiden Core bench pressing Collingwood players. Zach Fisher <laughs> just had to just a little bit to the left and, and, and North win that game. But yeah, Australia lost. What a finish, by the way. It was just a great game of footy to watch. In 17th, we have Richmond. Um, in 16th, we have West Coast, who had a bye. And in 15th, we have Adelaide, who... Gosh, their fans would just be really, really sad about this season. There was so much excitement, and it's all just fallen flat uh, with these Adelaide performances. Uh, you, you don't really know where it's derived from, but they just cut. They don't really bring it. Obviously, a game against Sydney that they weren't expected to win, but they blew a lead. Still up 30 points and crumbled. Yeah. So. 14th, we have St Kilda, who, as we said during the week, this was a, the, their biggest win of the year, scoring 100 points, about double as many as they score most weeks. So they should take it. They finally were able to kick some goals. They found where the goals were. Jack Higgins kicked five. But Brisbane, who were in some pretty good form, took care of them. And this St Kilda is not a team that will be competing for finals this year. In 13th, we have Melbourne, who had the bye this week. And wow, they really needed it because they are really out of form and they'll be hoping to bounce back after the bye. In 12th, we have Gold Coast, also with a bye. And in 11th, we had Geelong. And then this is where some changes start to happen. In 10th, we have the Fremantle Dockers who absolutely plunge from fourth place, going way down. And they should be a little bit worried because I think this is a team where when you look at their age their age demographic and where they would view themselves as a team, they want to be premiership contenders, but they just can't bring it consistently enough. And the way that Justin Longmuir was spoke, speaking about the team after the game, he seems really, really worried about that performance. Well, I think it's scary when you're not sure what you're going to get. Like, as a fan, you're not sure if you're going to beat Melbourne by 90 points or you're going to lose to like lose to Melbourne by 90 points. Yeah, completely. Uh, so we know that their midfield have been putting up insane stats throughout this year and their defense has been solid at points. But, uh, yeah, you don't know what you're going to get out of them. And I think they want to be at a much more reliable place in their like development as a squad. In ninth, we have Brisbane, who are slowly making their way up after such a poor start to the season. They might be starting to hit some form now. They've got a great run home, yep. so I think we could expect them to, to slip into the eight. Now, six wins from 13 games, but if anyone could make a charge from, from deep, it would be Brisbane at the moment, I reckon. And then next up, we have Port Adelaide, who, unless something crazy has happened at the end of this recording, it's currently in the fourth quarter. They should have lost to GWS. And yet another game. Actually, I'm going to switch this live. I'm going to put them below Brisbane because Port cannot win a game against a contender. They haven't done it this season. They didn't do it in the second half of last season. They really are sort of flat-track bullies. And I've mentioned this previously. They cannot get a game, uh, a win against a good team. In seventh place, I have Essendon, who also had, the, had a much, much needed buy alongside Melbourne because they have lost a couple of games now and they will absolutely be wanting to get their mojo back. Percentage below 100. And so now all those doubters who are like, like myself early in the season who were saying, yeah, they're getting these wins, but are they playing footy that's good enough? Are they winning games dominantly? Uh, they're going to have to prove those doubters wrong after the bye. In sixth place, I have the Bulldogs, who there are opposite vibes with the Bulldogs at the moment. Uh, they are in good form, but they, get these, they keep getting these big wins, but can they pile a few together? We know they're a team that has the talent all over the place. They just scored 150 points against one of the best defences in the league. Rory Lobb was probably top five players on the ground. Yep, no Aaron Norton, no Sam Darcy, and they scored 149 points against Frio's defense. So, geez, the, what the Bulldogs can do when they're on is so, so good, and they just need to string it together for a few games, find a way to be consistent. In fifth, GWS. We know that they have the talent everywhere. We know how scary good they were at the start of the year, and this is now a couple of big wins on the trot. Um, they, they, I think... 
this is where they charge and I feel very confident that I think they'll make the top four massive my, Sydney derby next week that'll be huge They're, unfortunately they have to play Sydney twice but uh, GWS is looking good again uh, really restricted Port's midfielders today barely pretty much none of them got 20 plus disposals in that Port midfield in fourth Collingwood who scrape across the line against North but I think just the pure momentum from that last quarter and a half keeps them in the top four uh, in third are the Hawthorne Hawks and I don't think this is unfair I've made them earn their way up. I've made them have to jump in increments. But this is where they have stamped themselves as one of the best two or three teams in the league at the moment. If you're a team wanting to get a win, the two teams you do not want to play are Sydney and Hawthorne at the moment. And I think anyone that's watching the AFL closely believes that. They are so exciting. Uh, you got Will Day, Giant Newcomb, James Wolfe all throwing their bodies around in the midfield, getting it forward. And if they didn't have that one point loss to Port Adelaide, they'd be in the top eight right now. Yep, and I'm jumping on your bandwagon that Dylan Moore, if and if all things stay the same, Dylan Moore needs to be in the Australian team. What a leader he is for that team. In second place, we have Carlton, and who also uh, sat out this week, but we know that they're building a really strong season. They have the talent everywhere, a team that's played together a little while now. And they will be wanting to charge and get a home. They will be wanting to finish in second and make a charge towards a home prelim final, I reckon. In first, we have the Swans. Once again, go down 30. No worries. Yep, lift them a little bit. Very good. That's where the power ranking sit for this week. Uh, No arguments at all. I think we'd all agree. But if you argue, leave it below. We'll see you on the next one.